Welcome to the Green Left Report, media for the 99%. I'm Simon Butler. And I'm Mel Barnes. This show will speak to Stop CSG Illawarra's Jess Moore about the dangers of coal seam gas mining and the growing movement to stop it. Plus, we'll show footage of a historic ceremony in Sydney that awarded 200 people an Aboriginal passport, including WikiLeaks Editor-in-Chief Julian Assange. But first, this episode has a special focus on the anti-Muslim hysteria that's been promoted by Australia's mainstream media and major political parties in the wake of a small Muslim protest in Sydney CBD on September 15. About 300 people took part in the protest, which like other recent Muslim protests around the globe, was sparked by an Islamophobic YouTube video made in the US. Green Left Weekly published two eyewitness reports about the rally, both of which said the New South Wales police were responsible for the violence on the day after they pepper sprayed and attacked what had until then been a peaceful rally. Alone among the mainstream media, SBS news coverage of the rally was similar to that of Green Left. We were standing here with about 100 protesters and what felt like several hundred police when the protesters attempted to leave the park peacefully and then police literally just set upon them. There was a massive skirmish. The protesters responded by throwing bottles and rocks and sticks. Police did not muck around. They pulled out the pepper spray and they took down at least two protesters right in front of me uh, in a fairly violent manner. And then the entire group charged across Hyde Park and that's where it all really fell apart. Police just divided and conquered. They chased them down the street, they chased them away, but not before protesters smashed the windscreen of at least one police car and also received another few injuries. So it was an extremely violent day. Mounted police, dog squad police, you can hear the dog squad behind me. Mounted police, dog squad, hundreds of officers. It was an extraordinary show of, of force and it ended uh, violently. Liberal Senator Brett Mason moved a motion in the Federal Senate on September 18 to condemn Green Left Weekly for, quote, its publication of articles blaming police for the confrontation. The motion failed 30 votes to 35. Green Left stands by its coverage and considers Mason's motion a disgraceful attempt to intimidate a media outlet from expressing its views. The Green Left Report spoke to University of Melbourne PhD candidate and researcher Muhammad Taba about the context behind the recent Islamic protests. We asked him whether the protests were really just about a YouTube film. Excellent question. I think that's the main question we need to be asking. I have heard a lot of commentators uh, saying it's a really stupid reason to be protesting. That's a very shallow reading of the events. It is very, very obvious for anybody who's paying attention that there's a much broader context here. And you can see this when the protesters bring in things like Afghanistan, mentioning death and corpses, even the targets of the protests. So it's, it's not any coincidence, I think, that they're all targeting a symbols of power. So they're targeting US embassies. Even the people who are being targeted um, and attacked are representatives of governments of power. So they're not just attacking random people on the street out of pure anger and fury, as some people are saying. It's a very, very specific attack on power itself. And so I think those sorts of readings, which you know talk about hate and anger, I think they're very shallow types of readings. We also asked Harbour about the response of the mainstream Islamic groups to the protests in Sydney. What the leaders have done almost entirely actually is to come out and condemn the protesters instantly. There are a few issues with this. Number one, they did that before anybody was charged. And as we say, I mean, with the Sydney protests, we know there were reports of police aggression and police instigating the violence. The group that was raided recently in Springvale in Melbourne, the concerns that were raised were things like we were concerned with their language, their tone and their manner. Now, none of these things are illegal. Other things they mentioned were they're a fringe group, they're a marginal group, their imam is not registered. None of these things is illegal. And so what ends up happening is you criminalize people for not being nice enough or not conforming to this popular idea of what a good Muslim should look like. And it's very, very unfortunate and again a sort of betrayal on the part of the leadership that rather than fighting against this tendency of separating Muslims into good and bad, they're actually the ones perpetuating it and making the problem worse by defining people according to marginal, mainstream and so on. I mean, it's not a crime to be a marginal figure, it's not a crime at all. And I think we should be collectively defending the marginal precisely because they're marginal. And instead what the leadership is doing is they're attacking them in their greatest time of need when they're being excluded by everybody else. Instead of coming to their defense, they're actually attacking them. By focusing on the protest or even the video, we're dealing with the consequences of the problem rather than the problem itself. And so I think the two issues that need to be asked here are one, why are the youth so angry? And number two, why are they expressing themselves in this manner? So why are they so angry at the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, Palestine and so on? But the reasons I think why they're expressing themselves in this manner is because they feel so betrayed and let down by the leadership. The leadership is 
more intent on pleasing authorities and siding with the government and, and police, more so than defending the rights of their own community. And so there is no real effective uh, avenue of expression for these youth. And so what I'm seeing is that the rage is building up and building up. They're seeing this injustice across the world and persecution. And rather than the leaders bringing this to attention of governments and authorities, instead they see them whining and dining with them and there's a massive disconnect between the leaders and the youth. And I think this is why they're just getting so frustrated and taking to the streets. Thanks so much for that, Mohammed. No problem. All right. Thanks so much for having me. Joining us now is Rebecca Kay, a Muslim and a community activist based in Bankstown. Welcome, Rebecca. Thanks very much for having me, guys. So the first thing we wanted to ask you was, what's your perspective about the protests that happened last weekend? It was disappointing that it got the um, amount of coverage that it did in the media and the perspective that the media portrayed these people to be barbarians and, and extremists and racists and that they want to, you know, unbalance Australian society and make it like an evil type of place to live and push their own agendas onto the Australian community. Mm. I found that very disappointing because it was far fetched from what really happened. Were you there at the protest? Yeah, I was at you the protest. You were there. So yeah. Can I ask you about someone who took part in the rally and then saw the media coverage afterwards? Can you compare that to some of the other rats and the other events which the media has covered since, such as a riot in Perth, in the Perth suburbs, and also a, a far-right protest which took place in the weekend in Melbourne? Yeah. The media seemed to cover those events very differently to the protests mm. in September 15. From what I read in, in the media, the protest in Perth was much more um, vicious. There was more people attending. You know, police officers were sent to hospital. You know, young boys were stabbed. There was no call for white Anglo-Saxon community leaders to come in and speak to these kids, you know, where are the parents, they're such bad parents, you know, let's take these children out of their homes, you know, because the parents are obviously not looking after them correctly. Mm. Also the one on Sunday in Melbourne. I was disappointed because they didn't speak about the hate mm. and they didn't speak about the racism mm. and, and they're just totally dodging the reason why that they were there, you know, mm. they're holding up Australian flags like this is their country and they decide who should be here and who shouldn't be here and mm. what we should be preaching and what we should be learning mm. and what society accepts or not. Well, one of the most disgraceful things that I thought came out of it was the cause for that, um, for the mother of the child who was holding the placard, for the children, her children to be taken away from her. I mean, there was a commentator in the Sydney Morning Herald and a Liberal MP who publicly said this woman doesn't deserve to have her children. And I thought that that was so outrageous because she hadn't broken any laws mm. and holding a placard isn't a violent act in itself. Mm. Um, and then it came out that she was so fearful that her child was going to get taken away from her that she went to the police station and confessed, you know, I I'm the mother, this is my child. And they found out that, in fact, she didn't know English very well, she didn't understand what the word behead meant, and that didn't actually get very widely reported at all. That was the placard that was most um, widely distributed. Oh, around the whole world. I have to agree with you, yes, she, she was a new immigrant to Australia. She was from um, Jordan. It was really disappointing, you know, there are children out there who are suffering every day with parents with addiction, with uh, parents who have, like, that don't know how to take care of their children, or, you know, children running away from home, or living in abuse, you know, these are the real people that we should be worried about, not some lady whose son picked up a sign off the floor and held it up. Yes, I would never want my child to hold up that sign, but yes, I knew she couldn't read English and I knew she couldn't speak English. I can, you know, being within the community, you find out this kind of information. But in saying this, I must commend her for going to the police station and fessing up for it, because if she didn't fess up for it, we'd still be hearing about it today. Mm. So right. that's just the bullying tactics of the major media corporations that, you know, this woman would have been tarnished mm. until she did step forward. Green Left Weekly has copped a lot of criticism for defending the protest from happening and saying and that... And the rights to protest. And the right to right. protest. That's right. Yeah, I mean, even though, I mean, we don't agree with a lot of the messages at, at the protest, that's but right. everyone has the right to protest and people don't deserve to be pepper sprayed by the police and beaten up by the police. And a lot of the eyewitness accounts that Green Left Weekly published showed that the police were the ones who instigated the violence. They were the one that escalated the situation. I love protesting. <laughs> I always have loved protesting. <laughs> I believe protesting empowers the community and gives you a platform to stand up and make them kind of understand where you're coming from and how this injustice is making you suffer. We seem to forget that at the beginning of the year some of the biggest protests of the whole year were in Canberra with the carbon tax. Mm. So a lot of them right-winged people were protesting themselves but they're only allowed to protest when they see it fit. Mm. 
which is the disappointing part. You know, as an Australian citizen, it is our democratic right to be able to protest. Just finally, Rebecca, there have been protests all around the world, um, Muslim people protesting. We spoke to Mohammed Taba earlier, and his explanation for these protests was to say you can't just put it down to that Islamophobic YouTube film. Mm. There's much deeper issues, particularly the fact that there are Muslims dying every day um, mm. by in wars which our Australian government and other Western governments support. That's right. No one wants death, okay? But we've seen a million innocent women and children and families die in Iraq. You know, Afghanistan's the same. It's not working over there. And, you know, there was a half a million people that marched down to George Street of the Australian community. They don't want to go into this war, and yet the government still sent them. You know, where's the justice in that? All right, well, thank you so much for coming on to Thanks. the Green Left Report. We Thanks very much. Thanks, yeah. Thanks, guys. Now for some more activist news. Lawyer and human rights activist Kelly Tranter spoke alongside independent journalist Wendy Bacon and former US Marine lawyer Michael Morey at a forum about WikiLeaks and the law held at New South Wales Parliament on September 12. I've written elsewhere on the various indicators that Assange's extradition to Sweden for questioning obviously is the first step in extraditing him to the United States. Everything points that way. But perhaps what's most telling is that every country in the chain has refused to give diplomatic assurances that Assange will not be extradited to the United States. They wouldn't give that assurance to Assange and they wouldn't give it to Ecuador. If there was no intention to extradite him to the United States, why wouldn't the assurances readily have been given? What faces Assange if he is extradited to the United States is, at the very least, inhumane treatment of the kind presently being doled out to Bradley Manning. That is not my view, that is certainly the view of many experts, including his lawyers. It's abundantly clear that the purpose of incarcerating and mistreating these people is not just personal punishment, but demonstration by example of what happens to any person who dares to cross the powers that be. In jurisprudential jargon, it's the twin purposes of punishment and deterrence. I've also voiced my criticism of the stance taken by the Australian government since Assange surrendered himself in England. Not only has our government done nothing to protect him, it's done nothing even to assist him. Foreign Minister Bob Carr's assurances otherwise are contradicted by the assistance offered to the Australian lawyer recently imprisoned in Libya, mm -hmm. and more recently to Austin McCall, an independent journalist detained in Egypt. Bob Carr's assurances really become incredible when you look at the assistance offered to an Australian arms dealer, Bradley John Thompson. About 200 people received Aboriginal passports at a Sydney ceremony on September 15. Aboriginal activist and socialist Ray Jackson issued a passport to Julian Assange, which was accepted by Assange's father, John Shipton. Yes, this is the passport. That we recognise as the traditional, cultural and historical owners of this land we now inhabit. <laughs> this is the declaration that you must sign in order to get the passport, which goes to say that the Aboriginal people are sovereign help the Aboriginal people to reclaim the sovereignty. That is the only way that this passport becomes a reality. Shipton was asked about the address on his son's new passport. <laughs> but took care of the Ecuadorian embassy. A lot of work has gone into this to bring this passport ceremony to fruition. Always was, always will be. Renowned Israeli historian Ilan Pape addressed a forum at the University of Sydney on September 16 as part of a national tour. Famous for documenting the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians from their historic homeland in 1948, Pape spoke about the forgotten Palestinians who still live in Israel's border. Every Palestinian who lives inside Israel as a citizen knows that they are on probation. Their existence in the state is conditional. For instance, when they demonstrated in support of the Second Intifada, the Israeli government decided that the police can stop such demonstrations with shoot-to-kill policy. In the 64 years of Israel existence, 500 new Jewish settlements inside Israel were built. Not even one Palestinian village was allowed to be built. And sometimes in life you have to make a choice. And you have to ask yourself, what would you like your children to be in the future, citizens of a democratic, free state, or citizens of an apartheid Jewish state. These are the only two options. 
A group of environmental activists gathered on the steps of Australian mining giant Linus Corporation's office in Sydney on September 20 to protest the company's move to build a rare earth mineral refinery in Malaysia. They said the protest was in solidarity with the huge movement in Malaysia that is against the project. And the main reason that Linus wants to refine it in Malaysia and not in Australia is to save costs by its own emission. The ones who do it on the cheap. We know that they moved to Malaysia because they knew that with lower environmental standards and with lower labour standards, they think they can get Linus, away. Linus, you must go. Linus, Linus, you must go. The people of Malaysia have said no. The people of Malaysia have said no. Linus, Linus, here's a case. Linus, Linus, here's a case. We don't want your toxic waste. We don't want your toxic waste. Earlier this month, the New South Wales government announced its new land use policy, which failed to protect any part of the state from coal seam gas mining. The decision flies in the face of widespread community concern that CSG will worsen climate change and poses a dire threat to water supplies, agriculture and human health. The Green Left Report asked Stop CSG Illawarra's Jess Moore about it. The government released a number of, of different policies actually on September 11, all of which were about coal seam gas and other mining. What it did was establish what's called a gateway process for development. Um, and I guess it really is what it sounds like, that is the new path to CSG development. It's not a policy to create no-go zones, which was the pre-election promise. So before the election we were told that um, strategically important areas would be protected from coal seam gas and other forms of mining. The next Liberal National Government will ensure that mining cannot occur here, will ensure that mining can't occur in any water catchment area, and will ensure that mining leases and mining exploration permits reflect that common sense. No ifs, no buts are guaranteed. But that's not what we've got no part of New South Wales, not where our food is grown, not where our drinking water comes from, is off limits to, to coal seam gas development. The other thing that the government did is on the same day they lifted the freeze on fracking. So fracking which involves blasting large volumes of water with sand and chemicals into the ground to actually fracture coal seams, that's back on, which is really scary. It's been a long-term demand of the campaign to get a ban on, on fracking. On the same day that the new policy was released, the government offered 22 CSG exploration renewals. So essentially we'd had a, a freeze on renewals and new licences in the state um, because there's such enormous community concern and opposition to coal seam gas development. Um, but in one day the government offered 22 renewals over 5 million hectares of New South Wales. So it's essentially an enormous um, ramping up of the industry. It's the government saying, we want you to explore and we want you to develop this industry. We also asked more about the risks of CSG mining and also the community response against it. In order to get the gas out of the ground, you actually have to draw water out of the coal seam. That gas is trapped by water pressure. So that water is contaminated. It contains methane, salt, and it can contain toxic and radioactive compounds and heavy metals. So immediately when you mine for coal seam gas, you've got this waste water product. Um, at the same time, there's the water or the liquids that are used in drilling, and particularly if hydraulic fracturing is happening, we're talking about enormous quantities of water that are contaminated with sand and chemicals. Um, so, you know, this poses enormous risks in terms of, one, growing food, because if either you've got water that's got toxic or radioactive compounds or heavy metals, you're posing problems in terms of your food and the health of your food. Um, but also, if salty water escapes into a fresh water environment, it kills the productive quality of the land. Um, and particularly in the Illawarra, when we're talking about a drinking water catchment, it's a huge concern that, that some of these wastewater drilling fluids um, would actually escape into our drinking water catchment. I guess the other two major concerns when it comes to drinking water are, one, it's it, coal seam gas production has an enormous above ground footprint. So you actually need a wellhead every 300 to 900 metres, all connected by roads and pipelines. Um, you know, looking at different industry documents, you can be talking, you know, a hectare of land clearing per well or um, four hectares of land clearing per well, um, depending what's there. Now, obviously, land clearing, laying roads, laying pipelines in a drinking water catchment um, poses threats. I guess lastly, and this is a big concern as well, coal seam gas mining always involves leaking methane. 
Now, methane is a highly explosive, highly potent greenhouse gas. Uh, and actually in the Illawarra, we've gone and looked at some of the, the proposed well sites um, and taken photos. And there was a fire that went through that area a couple of weeks ago now, and actually it burned right through where two of the well sites are. So obviously if you've got a, a gas well sitting in that area, you've got additional risks posed around fire. Communities are furious about the new policy and really see it as betrayal. It actually broke a huge number of, of pre-election promises. We've had cases where farmers obviously are choosing to lock their gate. So even though they don't formally have the right to say no to coal seam gas mining companies coming onto their land, they're doing it because they need to, because that's about protecting our food. Now, um, it occurred to people that it's not just about individuals locking the gate on coal seam gas, but communities need to have the ability to lock the gate on coal seam gas mining companies. So in the northeast of the state, um, what, what are called CSG free communities started, and that is communities, every household uh, had their door knocked on, and communities voted on whether or not they wanted coal seam gas mining. Um, and it's been enormous levels of opposition from communities. Now, in the Illawarra, we've decided to do this too, which I guess is a bit of a challenge in a sense because we're a much more densely populated area, so it's a lot more doors to knock on. Um, but we've decided that starting with five suburbs, we're going to knock on every door and ask people what they think because the government failed to ask communities whether or not we want coal seam gas development and actually this is it's really important that communities can have their voice heard on this issue and I guess it's a, it's, it's a really important thing in terms of strengthening community resolve around coal seam gas. And finally we asked more about plans for a national week of action against coal seam gas mining. It's actually October 13 to 21. Uh, groups across the country are actually going to be campaigning um, to stop coal seam gas mining and in the Illawarra, what we're going to be doing on October 21 is a human sign against coal seam gas. So we've actually done this once before uh, on Austin near Beach. Last year we had 3,000 people spell out stop coal seam gas uh, and this time we'll be spelling out protect H2O stop CSG. Um, and we expect again a large number of people from the Illawarra community will come out because people are extremely worried about this. It's our drinking water, it's actually the drinking water for Greater Sydney, which I think is still something more people need to know. There are five drinking water catchments in New South Wales that feed Greater Sydney. Um, drinking water for 4.3 million people. We've got two of the drinking water catchments and both of them are covered by CSG exploration licences and there's been development approvals given there. So we really want to focus on water and actually raising awareness across Greater Sydney that our, where our drinking water comes from is, is under threat. And now, let's hear from Carlos Sands. G'day, I'm Carlos Sands and welcome to Carlos Corner. Now a billboard ad running on subways in New York uh, that's been funded by uh, an organisation called the American Freedom Defence Institute reads, in any war between the civilised man and the savage, support the civilised man. Support Israel, defeat jihad. I'm sure we can all agree that one of the sure signs of being a civilised man, aside from by making that statement excluding half of humanity, is to label an entire race, in this case Palestinians, as savages. But what are some of the other sure signs you are a civilised man? Well, I think one of the key signs must surely be a willingness to subject one and a half million people to a sustained five-year-long medieval-style siege in a place like, say, Gaza. And during that, launch a 22-day-long prolonged bombing campaign that kills more than 1,400 people, a third of them children, then tightens the siege to prevent medicine and other essential goods getting in to allow them to rebuild, and then periodically just keep bombing them again and again and again, and then, if they dare complain, shout to the rest of the world, look, see, the savages hate us. That's always a good sign. I also find another good sign is if, for some reason, people just don't believe you and try and bring some humanitarian aid to the savages. A key sign of being civilised, the civilised response to this, is to board their ship in international waters and shoot nine foreign nationals dead. 
But far be it from me to try and suggest it's only Israel, only the Israeli state are working for civilization. Another key sign I find is a willingness to occupy one of the poorest nations on earth, overthrow their brutal fundamentalist government only to reinstall another brutal fundamentalist government and then win that war, which according to one recent report has killed more than five million people, is being lost, renegotiate to reinstate the brutal fundamentalist she overthrew in the first place. And the best news, the really good news, is there's no end in sight for the struggle for civilised values over savagery. Why? Only the September 15 London Telegraph reported on a huge build-up of naval forces in the Persian Gulf as a result of fears that Israel was about to launch an unprovoked strike against Iran. Now, I must admit, my gut reaction was pretty much to oppose this potential new war for the oil giants to get their hands on dwindling supplies of a fossil fuel, the burning of which threatens to destroy the planet through global warming. But then I read on the London Telegraph site that Iran is training 3,000 female ninja assassins to defend their country. Now, I'm not claiming this war is going to do much for civilization, but you've got to admit this latest phase in our seemingly inevitable slide towards brutal savagery? If it's going to involve ninjas, then it's pretty cool. I mean, we could try and stop this war, but come on, Iranian female ninja assassins. Think about it. I'm Carlo Sands. That's my corner. Thanks, Carlo. That's it for this episode. The Green Left Report is a unique radical media project that relies on the support of its viewers. If you like what you see, then please donate to help keep us challenging corporate media spin. Details are on screen now. Goodbye. Goodbye. Against the wall, the gift of life is no gift after all. And so for this, the struggle must continue.